Henya Gold, thanks so much for coming on to Evolution Soup, all the way from Boston, Massachusetts. Very near to where I grew up, actually. Well, thank you so much for having me on here. I'm very excited to be here. You are an assistant biology professor at Suffolk University, Boston, researching theropod dinosaurs and also the brains of not only living birds, but also that of the extinct dodo bird, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, how have you been doing since the coronavirus lockdown? Are you able to get on with your research from home or are you champing at the bit to get back to the university and back out into the field? I've been doing okay since lockdown started. Um, I am fortunate that I can do research from my computer um, but that said I am a mom to a two-year-old and so this summer I'm going to be mostly focused on her development uh, as a person rather than my own uh, development as an academic um, and then we'll see how the year plays out hopefully I can get some research done but for right now that is on the back burner as I mentioned in the intro I grew up very near Boston and it was a great place to go on school trips I fondly remember the science museum and the New England aquarium and how inspiring they were I trust they've been going strong at least before the lockdown yeah, they're, they're both phenomenal institutions. Uh, I've been to both multiple times in the two years that I've been in Boston, and they're both really great. Uh, we took our students, our anatomy students, to see the Body Worlds exhibit that was just at the Science Museum. So um, both great for personal visits and for uh, teaching purposes. Okay, let's get into the world of the dodo. Everybody loves the dodo bird. There are cartoons, references, quotes. Everybody has probably used the line as dead as a dodo bird or gone the way of the dodo. American humorist Will Cuppy famously said, the dodo seems to have been invented for the sole purpose of becoming extinct and that was all he was good for. Uh, I mean, it seems a little unfair, a lot of this, doesn't it? Because the dodo was a pretty successful species, really, uh, at least originally. Yeah, so the dodo lived on the island of Mauritius. Uh, that's off the coast of Madagascar, for those who aren't familiar with Mauritius. It's a small tropical island. It has uh, two seasons, a warm, humid season and a cooler, drier season. Um, and the dodo existed on that island in that ecosystem in relation with other animals and other plants and things that lived on the island. Um, perfectly successfully before people showed up. So there probably weren't large predators that were going after the dodo. Maybe some things going after the eggs because they were ground nesters, but uh, if there had been large predators going after them, I don't think they would have been quite as successful as they were previous to humans showing up. Well, before we get into your findings concerning the brain of the dodo, let's just get some facts down about the species itself, Raphus cucolatus. So what do we know about this bird, its size, weight, what it ate, and what its closest living relatives were and are? Sure. Um, so the, the dodo was about three feet tall, um, weighed somewhere between 10 and 15 kilos or 20 to 35 pounds. Um, and it's a pretty sizable bird. Uh, other sort of terrestrial Flightless birds can vary in size from um, things like the tinamou, which is sort of partially able to fly, um, to something the size of an ostrich, which is huge. So it fits right in there in that range. Um, its closest living relative is the Nicobar pigeon, which is found um, around the coastal regions of India, the Malay Peninsula, the Solomon Islands, places like that. Um, that particular bird is about 16 inches in height and weighs about a pound, so much smaller than the dodo was. Uh, in terms of actual closest relative, its closest relative was the Rodriguez solitaire, which is another uh, giant flightless extinct bird from an island off the coast of Madagascar. 
And the history of the dodo's discovery is pretty fascinating as well. It all began with some 16th century Dutch sailors, isn't that right? So the island was discovered in the late 1500s, around 1590s, 1599, um, when the Dutch sailors found it. They reported back to Europe that they found this island, that there's these giant flightless birds on it. Um, and that was right around the time around when people wanted to have these animal menageries um, as a sign of wealth and, and uh, knowledge. Um, and so they made these requests of the sailors to bring back live dodos for their menageries. Those dodos were then put on those ships and brought back uh, and would live some duration of time in Europe before ultimately perishing. Um, because they were so rare, the owners of these dodos would have them painted in portraits. And so that's how we know that some of our earliest information about dodos comes from these portraits that were made from animal menageries. Um, unfortunately, with those that uh, flux of Dutch sailors coming in, it wasn't just the sailors coming to the islands. They would leave invasive species not on purpose, supposedly, but rats, pigs, other animals would end up on these islands and eat the same food that the dodos ate or um, eat the, the eggs since they were ground dwellers um, and ultimately caused the uh, extinction of that bird. Well, what people always want to know is how the dodo went extinct. There's this kind of urban legend that says that the dodos were so dumb that they just marched on the Dutch sailing ships and were slaughtered. Uh, but that wasn't exactly what happened, was it? Correct. So in other places where people haven't been around as long, like for example, the islands of the Galapagos, um, animals don't have an innate fear of humans and they will come right up to you. Um, I suspect something similar happened when the Dutch showed up on Mauritius, is that these birds were curious, they didn't, hadn't seen people before, and so they probably just went up to explore what they were seeing. Maybe some of them got put on the ships for food for the sailors on the way back, but I, uh, more, more recent evidence shows that they weren't just all herded onto ships. Um, it wasn't the sailors eating them that drove them to extinction. It was more the invasive species that the sailors brought with them, like rats, uh, pigs, um, other such animals that would eat the same food that the dodos needed, um, or actually eat their e um, eggs out of their nests that were on the ground. This is just a, a question from the top of my head, really, because I've heard this question before um, come up in uh, comments on my Instagram. Um, does anyone know exactly what the dodo tasted like? <laughs> sure. Um, there's actually contradictory evidence from the records of those sailors that some of them seemed to enjoy the taste of dodo and some of them thought it tasted terrible. So there's no record of what exactly it tasted like, um, but there are contradictory reports as to whether it was good or bad. But I suspect um, that is a very subjective uh, <laughs> opinion from those sailors, of maybe depending on how hungry they were at the time that they ate it. Well, Henya, you also researched the evolution of flight in theropod dinosaurs, that is, the dinosaur group that gave rise to birds. So what do we know about the evolution of the dodo? I can only assume that its dinosaur ancestors evolved the ability to fly, only to lose it again. Yeah, this is a common theme in the evolution of birds in that uh, several different lineages of birds evolved flightless members. Um, we have a pretty good idea that the base of the bird tree was able to fly based on fossil evidence of their closest relatives. Um, and then from those flying ancestors, we get all of the different birds we see today, um, all of the different groups. And within those groups, some of those members become flightless again. That could happen for several different reasons. One of those reasons is that they might end up, uh, a population of these birds might end up on an island that doesn't have any natural predators for that bird. Um, and if that's the case, if they can find food resources on the ground, they uh, don't need to fly as much. And if they don't need to fly as much, then over evolutionary time, they will reduce the amount of resources and energy they put into building flight muscles and they'll eventually become flightless. 
So we see examples of that on the Hawaiian Islands, on, of course, the Dodo in Mauritius, on Rodriguez, and on many different island settings, we get flightless members of bird groups. Right, let's find out once and for all just how intelligent this bird was, because the general consensus always has been that it was pretty dumb. Uh, you set out a few years ago to analyze the brain of the dodo, but how do you do that when the dodo has been extinct for over 350 years? <laughs> Great question. So we know that in birds, the brain fills up the space in the skull that houses that brain. So that we call that the brain case and the brain fills it up. There's not um, a lot of extra fluid. There's not a lot of extra uh, venous sinuses in there. It, it takes up most of that space. So we can use a technology called CT scanning, um, which uses x-rays. So if you've ever gone to the doctor and gotten an x-ray, you know that it's a single image, it flattens everything and makes it sort of two dimensional. A CT scanner will take thousands of x-ray images and put them all together like uh, slices of bread in a loaf. And so you end up with a three-dimensional digital model of the thing that you scanned. So we can CT scan skulls of extinct animals, fill in the brain case digitally, and end up with a digital mold of what that space would have looked like. And because the brain fills up that space, we actually get a really good model of what the brain of these extinct organisms would have looked like. So that is how I looked at the dodo's brain for the first time since it went extinct. To measure intelligence in something that's extinct um, mm -hmm. is something that is scientifically difficult. Um, what I did is I used the volume of the brain as a proxy to intelligence. So if we know, if we could compare it to other living birds um, and their brain volumes, maybe we can have an idea of approximately how much intelligence or brain power these extinct birds had. I compared brain volumes and body masses of seven living birds to the dodo and the um, Rodriguez solitaire and found that the sort of statistical relationship that those two numbers have, um, the dodo falls right in line with its relatives. So for its body size, it has a proportional brain volume uh, to something like the common pigeon or to the other pigeons that I scanned. Um, and so because of that, it its brain is the proportional size it should be for its body. Um, and uh, so I, I concluded that it was probably about as intelligent as the common pigeon is. Um, so I say that and I smile knowing that people don't usually think of the common pigeon as very smart. Um, but we know that, you know, pigeons are trainable. Um, we use them as messenger pigeons during World War II. Yes. And so there, there are aspects of, uh, of measurable intelligence um, in the common pigeon. And so we know that they weren't, that the dodo itself wasn't dumb. It just probably didn't have a natural fear of humans. Um, and at the time, you know, in the 1600s, that could have been viewed as being dumb. Um, but it was probably just as smart as the common pigeon is. Well, when I interviewed Professor Andrew Pask about the extinct thylacine, the so-called Tasmanian tiger, I asked about cloning, effectively de-extincting that animal. So, as everybody talk about cloning the dodo. So, I will preface this by saying I'm not completely up to speed as to what the, <laughs> the talks of cloning dodos are, but I can speak to what you would need in order for mm -hmm. cloning to be successful. Um, so first you need the entire DNA sequence of that animal. Um, we have DNA sequences of the dodo because it went extinct only so recently. Um, we have both mitochondrial DNA and nuclear DNA. So we do have some aspects of its uh, nuclear code. That's not the only thing you need though. You need a close relative that's a similar size in order to house the embryo. So if you think about uh, birds lay eggs, you need a close relative that has enough genetic similarity that the DNA from the dodo would combine 
with the DNA from the other species and an egg that would be big enough to house mm. the dodo embryo. As I said, the dodo's closest living relative is the Nicobar pigeon, which is about 16 inches tall versus the three foot tall dodo. Um, that Nicobar pigeon is about a pound, whereas the dodo was, you know, in adult sizes was about 20 to 30 pounds. Um, so I'm not sure that all of the elements are present uh, in order to have cloning be successful. In addition, if you create, uh, if you bring back these extinct species, you need somewhere to put them that would mimic the environment that they lived in. And for a lot of animals that have gone extinct um, in the past, that environment doesn't exist anymore. Um, for many animals that have gone extinct at the hands of humans, um, those environments might be still around, but not in the sizes that those animals might need. So there's a lot of other factors that go into cloning that might not be completely there to make a successful dodo. Uh, I had to ask because I know people will ask me, they're always asking about cloning, uh, things like that. Is there such a thing as a Bigfoot? <laughs> and also people want to know, could there still be a dodo out there? I suppose there probably isn't. Animals that historically haven't been exposed to people and then become exposed to people and get hunted by people learn very quickly to avoid people and so or learn eventually to, to avoid people so I'm, am i gonna say there's no chance that there's a dodo i'm gonna say that it's highly likely that there's no dodos i'd be surprised if we found a living dodo <laughs> So if there's anywhere that people would like to look online to learn more about the dodo, is there any place that you can send them? Yes, uh, a team led by uh, Dr. Clayson's 3D laser scanned an entire dodo skeleton, and that's available online on um, Sketchfab. Um, I, we'll send you the link to that so you can link it. And you can see every bone in really nice detail because they're all individually laser scanned and then put together. They did a really nice job with that. Okay, this has been such a fun and informative interview. It's a great subject, and the dodo seems to be loved by so many people, especially children, it seems. And speaking of children, you've written a children's book called She Found Fossils. So how did this project come about? This project is near and dear to my heart. Um, me and uh, my colleague from graduate school, Dr. Abigail West, wanted to write a children's book, and we came up with this idea um, while we were still together in grad school. We wanted to have a book that would provide role models for children all over the world of different women paleontologists that uh, grew up under different circumstances, um, found paleontology in different ways, they do paleontology differently, um, and we wanted those children to be able to open the book and find someone that looked like them so that they could relate and know that anyone can do paleontology anyone anywhere can do paleontology. Um, and uh, so we wrote this book, She Found Fossils, and it features women paleontologists from history, uh, women that are in the field today that are uh, professionals, and up and coming women that are in graduate school or early career that are just starting their careers in paleontology um, and uh, highlighting their stories, their struggles, and uh, what they went through the things that they found and why they love paleontology so much. Okay, thanks so much once again, Ohenya, and I will leave links to your website and Twitter in the description below, as well as a link to She Found Fossils, the book, and hopefully you can come onto the show again one day in the not-too-distant future to talk birds and dinosaurs. Thank you so much. This was great. I'd love to come back.